In the 1970s, the British Interplanetary Society devised a theoretical plan to send a spacecraft to a nearby star. That plan was named Project Daedalus. Let's find out more. The parameters of the project were to come up with a plan that would build a spacecraft using current or near future technology. This craft would then need to be able to reach a nearby star within the working life of a scientist or roughly 50 years. The spacecraft would have no crew, but it would contain a considerable array of scientific instrumentation and it would use these instruments to survey the star system once it arrived. So which star were they aiming for? Well, at the time it was thought that the nearest star system, the Alpha Centauri system, was planetless, and so not a very good target. The proposed destination instead was the next star in distance to us, Barnard's star. It's a little further away at 5.9 light years, but still within the project's parameters of a 50 year flight time. It was believed that Barnard's star had planets, and so it seemed to be a better choice at the time. We now know that both the Alpha Centauri system and Barnard star have at least one planet, and I've already made videos about those systems. It would appear that stars with planets are much more common than we thought in the 1970s. So what about the spaceship then? This was the Project Daedalus craft. It was designed to be a two-stage ship, weighing a total of 54,000 tonnes. That's about four times heavier than the Eiffel Tower. This meant that it would be too heavy to build here on Earth, as the fuel requirements of getting a ship that size into orbit would be prohibitive. Instead, the ship would be assembled in orbit, and of that 54,000 tonnes, only 4,000 tonnes would be actual spaceship, with the remainder being fuel for the mammoth journey. The ship would be in total 190 metres long, with a large proportion of that being taken up by the first stage. And it's the first stage of the craft that would fire its engines for two years, and during that time it would accelerate the spaceship to 7.1% the speed of light. That's just over 21,000 kilometers a second, or a little over 13,000 miles per second. At the end of this period of acceleration, the first stage would be jettisoned, and the smaller second stage would then fire for a further 1.8 years. This second period of acceleration would then end with the craft now travelling at 12% the speed of light, or 36,000 kilometres per second. That's just over 22,000 miles per second. At the end of the nearly four years of acceleration, and having used the last of their fuel, the engines would shut off, and the ship would now cruise for the remaining 46 years of flight time. Due to the fact that the interstellar medium is very thin, there will be nothing to slow the craft down, and so Newton's first law would apply, where a body, travelling, will continue to travel at a constant speed unless acted on by an outside force, and since there are no outside forces, Daedalus would continue on its journey at the same speed with no more need for fuel. And the fuel was potentially a problem. Rockets work by essentially igniting a propellant and creating an explosion. This explosion produces gases which expand and then by forcing the gases produced by this ignition through a nozzle, you create a force. The force of the propellant shooting out of the nozzle in one direction pushes the craft in the other direction. And here we're back to our old friend Newton. His third law states that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The faster the gases shoot out in one direction, the greater the acceleration in the other direction. Unfortunately, using chemical propellants like we use in today's rockets, the gases can't be forced out of the nozzle fast enough to produce enough acceleration to get the Daedalus rocket up to the speeds needed to cross the vast distances between two stars. Instead, the Daedalus project would use a fusion rocket. This would use pellets made from deuterium and helium-3. These pellets would be released from the fuel tanks and into the combustion chamber. 
Here, beams of electrons would be fired at the pellets, causing them to explode. The plasma produced by this explosion would be contained and directed out of the combustion chamber by a powerful magnetic field. And this will provide the levels of thrust needed to achieve the desired velocities for the journey. 250 of these pellets will be exploded per second during the craft's acceleration phase and the exhaust gases will be ejected from the rocket at speeds of roughly 10,000 km per second. By comparison, the main engines of the Saturn V rocket produce exhaust gases with a velocity of about 2.5 km per second. 50,000 tonnes of this fuel will be required for the acceleration phase of the mission. Helium-3 is unfortunately quite rare here on Earth, and so it was proposed that automated robotic factories kept aloft by hot air balloons in the clouds of Jupiter would mine this isotope over a period of 20 years. Let's have a look at the craft itself. Its operational parameters meant that it would have to withstand a huge range of temperatures, from about 1600 Kelvin right down to the temperature of the interstellar medium, which is about 3 Kelvin. And that's nearly absolute zero. It was proposed then that the craft be built from molybdenum alloyed with titanium, zirconium and carbon. This material would maintain its strength and continue to function at these extreme range of temperatures. Even though the interstellar medium is very tenuous, it isn't completely empty. To protect the spacecraft during its journey, a 50 ton disc of beryllium 7mm thick would act as a barrier to prevent damage from collisions with dust particles which travelling at these speeds would pack a considerable wallop. There would also be a fleet of mini-robot wardens. These would have artificial intelligence and would be able to act autonomously to repair the ship whilst in flight, if needed. In addition, once Daedalus reached Barnard's star and the risk of collisions increased, a fleet of support craft called Dustbugs would fly 200 kilometres in front of the spacecraft and these would generate a cloud of particles to disperse larger obstacles in its path. So how would it slow down once it reached its destination? Well, it wouldn't. That would require even more fuel, and would mean that not all of the fuel it carried would be able to be used for the journey there. So Daedalus would just sail on through the star system at 12% of the speed of light. However, halfway through its journey, it would deploy an array of instruments. These include two 5-metre optical telescopes and two 20-metre radio telescopes. It would use these to survey the approaching star system, still more than two light years off. This information would then be used to select the most interesting places in the star system to survey, and it would then instruct a series of probes that would be launched from the spacecraft at two intervals as it approached. The first launch would be at 7.2 years before it reached its target, and the second would be at 1.8 years. There will be a total of 18 probes, and they will be propelled by nuclear-powered ion engines. As they approach the star system, still travelling at 12% the speed of light, they would deploy a barrage of testing equipment, including cameras and spectrometers. It would use these to test for any signs of life, or any planets that might have conditions favourable for the development of life. The information gathered by the probes would then be relayed back to the mothership, which would then send its findings back to Earth. The engine bell of the second stage, now that it isn't being used for propulsion, would double as a communications dish. One potential variant of the Daedalus project would be to fit the second stage with a magnetic sail. This would deploy near Barnard's star and would be used for deceleration. This would mean that extra fuel for deceleration would not need to be carried to slow the starcraft down and would allow for a more detailed survey of the Barnard star system. And so that's the story of Project Daedalus, a wonderfully inventive and forward-thinking plan to send our first probe to the stars. And as the Russian scientist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky once said, the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one can't live in a cradle forever. For us, however, it is time for us to come back home, 
and look up at the night sky and wonder what's out there. But from me, and until next time we go exploring, thank you for watching. Many of the stars that we could see would be in a very similar position to how they would look from Earth. If we looked towards the constellation of Monoceros, we would see an additional bright star in the night sky. That's our sun. The whole of our civilizations and history is just there in that bright speck of light.